CPS Algebra 1 students and families. My name is Mrs. Potter and I'm your host for this week's episode of Algebra 1 BCPS TV style. Let's get started with our learning for this week. Over the past three weeks, we've heard from Dr. Joe Bowler, a professor at Stanford University, about some important math messages. These messages have included information about how your brain learns when you make mistakes, what it means to have a growth mindset, and how you need to exercise your brain. Let's learn about her last message. Our next message is that speed is not important in maths. You don't need to be fast to be good at maths. In fact, it may be better to be slow with maths. Some of the best mathematical thinkers in the world are really slow. Lauren Schwartz, a mathematician, wrote about feeling stupid in school because he was the slowest mathematical thinker. He went on to become a world-leading mathematician and he won the Fields Medal, the greatest prize in mathematics. This is a quote from his autobiography. I was and still am rather slow. I need time to seize things because I always need to understand them fully. Towards the end of the 11th grade, I secretly thought of myself as stupid. I worried about this for a long time. He goes on to say that he later realized something critical, that speed isn't important in math. What is important is to deeply understand mathematical ideas and connections. Whether you're fast or slow isn't really relevant. Steven Strogatz is another top mathematician at Cornell University. He talks about doing math problems in groups and being one of the last people to solve the problem. The reason many mathematicians are slow is that they think deeply about math. Steve talks about being excited for the first time about a math problem in high school. He then worked on the problem for six months and eventually solved it. It isn't important in maths to be fast. What is helpful in maths is to think visually and creatively. Maths isn't just about calculations. They may be the least interesting part. It's actually about patterns and space, seeing things differently and making connections. Maya Mirzakhani is one of the most amazing mathematicians of her time and she just won the Fields Medal. Her work is entirely visual and very creative. When she won the Fields Medal, other mathematicians talked excitedly about how she had made connections between areas of math that had never been made before. Even though Mariam is one of the world's leading mathematicians, her seventh grade teacher told her she couldn't do math. Fortunately for the world, she met others who believed in her, and she believed in herself, and she kept going. In school, many people get the wrong idea that faster students are better at maths, but we know that being fast doesn't mean that. Often the faster students have memorized more, but we know that better memorizers don't necessarily have more maths potential. No matter how math is presented in school, you should know that math is not about memorization and it is not about calculations. Math is a much broader subject about ideas, visualization, connections. And don't think grades or test scores define who you are and what you can do. You can do anything. While all four of the key messages that Dr. Bowler has shared are important, this week I want you to really focus on taking your time. Remember, math isn't about being fast, it's about visualizing and taking your time to really truly understand a topic. Let's start today with a think about a task. Up on the screen, there are three different situations for the amount of money that you could earn per day. Which situation would you rather have for 30 days? Why would you pick that? I know I didn't give you enough time to really think deeply about this, but I do want you to hear what some of my family members have to say. And remember, as you listen, think about how your beginning thoughts match up or might be different than what my family has shared. Hi, Spencer. Hello. So um, you've had a couple minutes to sit and think about which situation yes, you would rather exactly. have. Mm -hmm. Which one are you thinking or are you still um, considering it? Definitely not A. Okay. Uh, Why not? is only increasing by 100 per day. Uh, I think in the, uh, uh, situation C is doubling every day. So I think by the end of 30 days, situation C would give me way more money than A. And I think B would give me the middle amount because that's only increasing by three than by five. So that's just odd numbers is increasing. Increasing by odd numbers? Yeah, starting at three. Why do you think some people might pick situation A from the get-go? Because they're like, ooh, 100 bucks, give me 100 bucks, increasing by 100, that's a big increase. But eventually, situation C is going to be doubling. So it's going to go to 64 cents, then 128, then 256, then 512, then 1024. You're giving away all the answers. What? <laughs> 2048. You're giving away all the answers. 496, 4096. Right, so it's so going to you... keep going. So in the end, that's going to give you the most money. This is just going to increase by 100. 
And I don't, I don't know what that's doing. That's just kind of going. Well, guess what? They're going to learn about what situation A, B, and C are doing What's in this lesson. situation B doing? I can't tell you because then that would give away the I answer. I just look ahead in the lesson. Sure. Thanks, Ben. In our first learning objective for today, we're going to analyze various representations of a function in order to determine the function family that best models the function. The different representations that we're going to look at include a table, a graph, and an equation. You might recall the different function families that you've learned throughout the course, and those include linear functions, quadratic functions, and exponential functions. The material for this first learning objective is the same as the material in your print packet for the week of June 1st. This is lesson one. Let's learn about linear functions. The first thing that's true about a linear function is that when I look at a sequence of y values that represent a linear function, there's a common first difference. It's probably easiest to show you this in a sample table. Notice in my sample table that my x values are increasing by one and I, I see that there's a pattern in my y values. So to find that pattern or to find the common first difference, I'm going to calculate the current term or the current y value minus the previous y value. That will give me uh, my first difference. And I'm gonna check a couple places to make sure there's a common first difference. So in this particular example, my current y value is negative 4, so I'm going to calculate negative 4 minus negative 7. That's the same as negative 4 plus 7, which is 3. Let's look at another situation. My current y value is 2, so I have 2 minus negative 1 which is the same as 2 plus 1, which is 3. And I'll take a look at one more. My current y value is 11, so I'm going to calculate 11 minus 8, which is 3. So there's a current, there's a common first difference in this table, so I would say that it represents a linear relationship. I can also look at a linear relationship represented graphically. This graph represents the ordered pairs that come from the sample table, and you can see when I connect them, the graph is a straight line. The equation of this table and of this graph is f of x equals 3x plus 2. Notice that the common first difference, which was 3, is the same as the coefficient of the x term, which is also the slope. And finally, the general equation or the general form of a linear function is f of x equals mx plus b. And that's um, something that you might recall slope intercept form. Let's learn about quadratic functions. When I look at the patterns of, of the y values in a quadratic function, they have a common second difference. So let's examine what that looks like in a sample table. I'm going to calculate the current value minus the previous value. So here's my sample table, and in order to calculate the second difference, I need to first calculate the first difference. You learned about that in the linear functions video. So here are all my first difference values, and I can calculate my second difference by again taking the current value minus the previous value. So I have 5 minus negative 7, which is 2. I'm sorry, negative 5 minus negative 7, which is 2. Negative 3 minus negative 5, which is 2. Negative 1 minus negative 3, which is 2. 1 minus negative 1, which is 2. And 3 minus 1, which is 2. So my common second difference is 2. Here's the sample graph that goes along with the sample table. And you can see a quadratic function has a parabolic shaped graph. It's a U shape that opens either up or down. In this case, um, the graph opens up. The equation for the sample table and graph is shown on your screen, f of x equals x squared minus 2x plus 1. And the general form of a quadratic equation or a quadratic function is f of x equals ax squared plus bx plus c. And you know from our previous lessons that that's the standard form of a quadratic function. So let's learn about exponential functions. The pattern of the y values in an exponential function is a common ratio, and that's easiest to see in a sample table. Here's my table of values that represents an exponential relationship. Again, as um, was true in the linear um, function, 
the x values are increasing by one. So I'm going to take a look at how the y values are changing. I'm going to calculate a common ratio by taking the current value and dividing that by the previous value. So for example, 1 ninth divided by 1 27th is three. 1 third divided by 1 ninth is also three. One divided by 1 third is three and nine divided by three is three. So I can see the common ratio of my y values is three. Here's the graph that goes along with the um, data in the sample table. And you can see that in this particular example, the graph is always increasing, but it's curved, not a straight line like a linear function. The equation for this relationship is f of x equals three to the x. Notice how the base is the same as the common ratio that we calculated. And the general equation of a exponential function is f of x equals a times b to the x power. It's important to note that the b value needs to be greater than zero and can also not be equal to one. Now that I've summarized the different characteristics of linear, quadratic, and exponential functions, it's time for you to try it. In this try it activity, you're going to go back to the think about it task and take a look at the situations that we examined at the beginning. You're going to extend a pattern in a table, and you're going to identify the function family that each situation represents. You're also going to make a prediction about which situation you think will pay most on day 20. And finally, you'll continue to extend the table to day 20 to see if your prediction was correct. And you'll write a function rule that represents um, the pattern in the table. In summary, today, you analyze various representations of a function in order to determine the function family that best models that function. Remember, the different representations that we looked at were tables, graphs, and equations, and the function families that we analyzed were linear, quadratic, and exponential. As you work, make sure you take your time and really truly deeply understand the patterns that you see and the connections that you're making. Before we transition to our next learning objective, let's do another think about it. On the screen are the ages of contestants on game show number one and game show number two. How would you describe the ages of contestants on game show one and game show two? How would you compare the ages of the contestants on game show one and game show two? Take a minute and look. Let's see what my family has to say about the ages of game, the game show contestants on game show one and game show two. Hi, Lily. Hi. How would you compare the ages of contestants on game show one and game show two? Um, the contestants on game show one have a wider range and the contestants on game show two have a smaller range. Can you tell me what you mean by that? So on game show one, the smallest age is 18 and the highest age is 48 and that's a 30 year difference. And on game show two, the smallest age is 21 and the highest is 41 and that's only a 20 year difference. So we might also say that game show two has ages that are more consistent yeah. than game show one because mm -hmm. game show one is more spread out. Nice, thank you. <laughs> the material that we're going to cover in our second learning objective is to analyze data represented in a list, dot plot, histogram, and box plot in order to describe the data using statistics. This material is the same as, the, as your print packet for the week of June 1st, and this is lesson number two. Before we start describing data using statistics, there are two things we need to learn about. First, we're going to learn about statistics. Statistics are a single number that describe a data set. You might be familiar with mean and median as two statistics that are called measures of center. Measures of center are a single number that describe the center or the typical value in a data set. You might also be familiar with mode, which tells us the data value or values that occur most frequently in a data set. Sometimes there's no mode. The range and the interquartile range are called measures of spread. Measures of spread are used to describe the consistency of data values. And again, like I said before, we'll be looking at these in more detail. The second thing that we need to learn about are data displays. The first type of data display that we're going to look at is a dot plot. A dot plot takes the value in a data set and represents it on a number line. The frequency of the values in that data set are shown with dots. So for example, 
The age of 25 occurs three times in the data set. Another type of data display is a histogram. A histogram is a bar graph that is used to display the frequency of, a data, of the data divided into equal intervals. The bars must be of equal width and should touch but not overlap. The heights of the bars indicate the frequency of the data values within the interval. So for example, if the age of a contestant is between 40 and 50, it would occur in this interval right here, and we can see that two contestants are between 40 and 50. I'm sorry. We don't know exactly what those ages are, but we know that there are two between the ages of 40 and 50. The last type of data display that we're going to encounter is a box plot. And a box plot is useful because it shows you how the values in a data set are distributed. You need five values to make a, a box plot, the minimum or the least value, the first quartile value, the median, the third quartile value, and the maximum, or the greatest value. The data displays below show the ages of 17 contestants on American Ninja Warrior. I see the data represented as a list, and this list is, um, I put the data in order from least to greatest. Your data won't always be presented like that. There's a dot plot, a histogram, and a box plot. The first thing we're going to calculate is the mean. The mean is the sum of all the values in a data set divided by the number of data values. Sometimes you might hear it referred to as the average. I can use the list and the dot plot to calculate the mean. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add up my values, 19 plus 20 plus 20 plus 22 plus 22 plus 22 plus 22 plus 22. Do I have that? Yep. Plus 25 plus 25 plus 25 plus 29 plus 38, whoops, plus 40, plus 42, plus 50, plus 60. I'm going to hit enter, and my sum um, of all of the values is 503, and I'm going to take 503, and I'm going to divide that by 17, because they told me there are 17 contestants um, on American Ninja Warrior, and I get a value of 29 and 59 hundredths. So I would say that the mean age is 29 and 59 hundredths years. The data displays show the ages of 17 contestants on American Ninja Warrior. All of the data displays represent the same data. I have a list, a dot plot, a histogram, and a box plot. And now I'm going to calculate the median. For an ordered data set, so when I say an ordered data set, I mean that the data is in order from least to greatest. So when you calculate the median, first you have to put your data in order from least to greatest. If the ordered data set has an odd number of values, the median is the middle value. For an ordered data set with an even number of values, the median is the average of the middle two values. So I can use a list and a box plot to calculate the median of a set of data. If I'm using a list, I need to start at the upper end and the lower end and start kind of crossing off my data so that I can find the number that's directly in the middle. This data set had an odd number of values, so I have a single number that's in the middle, which is 25. If I want to use a box plot, I'm going to look at the vertical line that's in the box part of the box plot and I can see that that also says 25. So um, the 17 contestants on American Ninja Warriors have a median age of 25 years. I want you to note that you can also use a dot plot to help you find the median, but you either need to convert the data from the dot plot into an ordered list, or you need to carefully um, remove or cross off the data in the dot plot to find the median. The data displays below show the ages of 17 contestants on American Ninja Warriors. I have a list, a dot plot, a histogram, and a box plot. And this time, I'm going to calculate the mode. The mode is the value or values that occur most frequently in a data set. If all of the values occur with the same frequency, the data set is said to have no mode. So I can look at two different data displays to find the mode. I can look at a list and I can look at the dot plot. I can see in my list that 22 occurs most frequently out of all of the values in my data set. So I can see that 22 is the mode. This was really easy because my data was in order from least to greatest. I can also use, look at a dot plot to find the mode. I can see the 
the tallest or the um, age with the most dots is going to be my mode. And there are one, two, three, four, five dots above an age of 22. So I can see that from the dot plot, the mode is 22, which is what I found from my list. I want you to note that with a histogram, I can't exactly tell the mode um, because the bin width here is 10 years. So I know that the most values occur between 20 and 30 years, but I don't know which of those values occur the most. Now, if my histogram um, had a bin width of one, then I would be able to see which one value occurred the most, but because the bin width is 10, I can't see that value. So I can see here that my mode is 22 years. The data displays below show the ages of 17 contestants on American Ninja Warriors. There's a list, a dot plot, a histogram, and a box plot. We're going to calculate the range. The range of a set of data is the difference of the greatest and least values in the data set. I can use a list, a dot plot, and a box plot to calculate the range. I'm going to look for the greatest, or also known as the maximum, and the least, also known as the minimum, values in the data set. In my list, I can see that the minimum value is 19 and the maximum value is 60. And that was easy for me to see because my data was already in order from least to greatest. When I look on the dot plot, I see that 19 is the least value and 60 is the greatest value. And on my box plot, I also see that 19 is the least value and 16, 60 is the greatest value. Um, those are, it's the end point of the whiskers on the box plot. So recall, range is equal to maximum minus minimum, or in this case, 60 minus 19. So the range of the, seven, the, range of the ages of the 17 contestants on American Ninja Warriors is 41 years. The data displays below show the ages of 17 contestants on American Ninja Warrior. I see this data represented in a list, a dot plot, a histogram, and a box plot. And I'm going to calculate the interquartile range. The interquartile range, or IQR, is the difference of the third or upper quartile and the first or lower quartile in a data set, representing the middle half of the data. So I can use a list or a box plot to calculate the interquartile range. First, I'll show you how to do this with a list. I first calculate my median, and in this case, my median was 25. Next, I'm going to calculate the median of the lower part of my data and the upper part of my data. So when I look, I can calculate the quartile one value, which is the median of the first half of my data, and that's 22. And then I can calculate the quartile three value or the median value of the upper half of my data. So the third quartile value or Q3 is 39. And then to calculate the inner quartile range, I'm going to do the quartile three value minus the quartile one value. So I have 39 minus 22, which is 17 years. So in the middle 50% of the data, the range of the ages of the contestants in that middle 50% is 17 years. I can also use a box plot to calculate the interquartile range. And this is actually a little bit easier than using a list because I simply need to find the quartile one value, which is the leftmost part of my box and the quartile three value, which is the rightmost um, edge of my box. And I will simply subtract 39 minus 22 there as well. In the try it portion of your print packet, the first question asks you to come back to the data that was shown in the think about it activity to find the information, um, the statistics for game show two. And then you're going to compare those statistics to game show one. So make sure you look at the um, examples that are printed in your print packet to help you with a nice example. The second thing you're going to do is you're going to look at the ages of contestants on Family Feud. You're going to use these three data displays, the dot plot, the histogram, and the box plot to calculate the mean, median, mode, range, and interquartile range for the um, contestants on Family Feud. And then you're going to compare those to the contestants on American Ninja Warrior. I think it's safe to say that we met this learning outcome today. We analyzed data represented in a list, a dot plot, a histogram, and a box plot in order to describe the data using statistics. Nice job. 
Thanks for joining me today for this week's episode of Algebra 1 BCPS TV Style. Make sure you tune in next week because there's going to be a special guest joining me um, to help me teach the lesson. And I want you to take a look at this poster that I have up in my virtual classroom. Which step have you reached today? I won't do it. I can't do it. I want to do it. How do I do it? I'll try to do it. I can do it. I will do it. Yes, I did it. Make sure you keep those positive growth mindsets. Have a great week.